first sermon I was going to write was on trees. But a week later, God gave me this sermon. We'll be in 2 Peter a while, and we'll be in Hosea. Hosea tells of uh, the last 3,000 years of our lives, of Israel's lives, and our, our lives, last 3,000 years, ending in the last year, which is the millennial reign. I've always been a Bible prophecy person. I broke my teeth on Revelation right after I got saved. That's the first book I went into. And over the years, I've learned things and I've uh, saw things and, and heard things from different preachers, evangelists I trusted, like John Hagee and David Jeremiah. And it used to be it was uh, Jack Van Ippy before he died. Him and I, I, he used to come up with things that God had showed me. And I usually don't preach or teach on something unless one of these guys, which is Peggy or now David Jeremiah, unless they have it in one of their teachings or sermons, I usually don't incorporate it in mine because I don't have the formal education they have. But I trust them because I know they're good men of God and they've been around longer than I have, probably by 20 years. And so, Hosea was one of those scriptures God showed me years ago, a prophecy. Like I said, the last 3,000 years of our history. From the time of Christ's birth till the end of the millennial reign. God has time when it comes to prophecy. God's time sometimes are not our times. Like in Daniel, when he's prop when of the prophecy of when Israel went back to build Jerusalem till the time that Christ came to be. God used seventy weeks as his time. Now we think of weeks as seven days. But in God's time, a week to him is seven years. Yeah. And so we have to learn these when you're studying prophecy, you have to learn that God has a different time than what we have. So what you see in the first scripture I have up here, <clears throat> one of those uh, equations of God's time. And there's quite a few scriptures uh, that uh, uses this equation. And Hosea is one of those. And I didn't really understand Hosea 6, 1 through 3 till that came to my mind. Oh yeah, days equals years. 1 Peter 3, 8 talks about, is talking about scoffers at the end of the age when we're getting close to Christ's return. And it say, Peter says there would be scoffers at that time that would say, well, where is he at? He's been preached to us that he's coming back all these years and he still ain't back. They was looking for Jesus right after he went to heaven. They was looking for him to come back. Yeah. And it's been almost 2,000 years. So we got scoffers. And when I talk to people about his return, I have had older guys say to me, ah, I heard that when I was a kid. He ain't here yet. <laughs> and I thought, well, one of the signs of the end time, you're just one of them because you're a scholar. Yeah. So Peter, he wants to explain why Christ is a little bit slow coming back. And he says in 2 Peter 3 8, and I'm going to read my scripture out of New King James because I like that version. But beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. One day equals a thousand years. And a thousand years equals one day. So I'm a mathematician also, so <laughs> my equation. Day equals a thousand years. So 
So when we have that knowledge, then we can look at Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. He says, And come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken us, but he will bind us. And what happened when Jesus was here and after he left was the Jewish people was dispersed. Mm. A.D. 70, Titus came in and dispersed and destroyed Jerusalem to the ground. Mm. I've been over in Israel and all you're going to see at the uh, mount Temple Mount is the Wailing Wall. Mm. And a few arches on the point on one side of the mount. They destroyed it completely, wiped it out. And they was dispersed and they were and the Jewish people went through hard times when they was in other countries. In Spain they they were persecuted to a point where they had to leave Spain. Italy didn't want them. Hitler murdered murder six, six million Jews in the Holocaust. That was all going the first thousand years of Hosea and the second thousand years of Hosea talking about here. So where does the days part comes in? At verse 2 of Hosea says, after two days, we he will revive us. So for almost 2,000 years, they were persecuted. But in 1917, the British Empire was in control of Israel. And they started allowing the Jews to come back to Israel. And they started coming back in droves. And then in 19. 48, May 14th, they became a nation in one day. In 1967, they recaptured Jerusalem and made it once again a part of the nation of Israel. They were being revived by God, just as Hosea said. In the second day, they was being revived. The prophecy was being fulfilled. And in 2017, our great president, Mr. Trump, moved the embassy into Jerusalem, which made it once again the capital of Israel. Amen. Praise God. Amen. All the signs need to be fulfilled in Christ's second coming, and that Israel being revived has happened to this point. Since Christ started his ministry, it's been about 1,980 years. So we're right there. We're close to the second coming of Christ. And it makes me urgent to try and get people to realize how urgent the time is for us to be the church, to do what we're supposed to do. That we may live in his sight. That's the second part. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. The third day is the millennial, the last millennial top thousand years. See, when we, when Adam and Eve sinned, that changed God's time. We, Adam and Eve were supposed to live forever. They had the tree of life. But when they sinned, then God decided we're going to have 7,000 years to live. The first 4,000 happens in the Old Testament. The last 3,000 started when we went from B.C. before Christ to A.D. after his birth. So here is what was Hosea in ch chapter 6 verse 1 and 3 this is what he's prophesied those last three years verse 3 says let us know 
let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. And that's what we're going to be going through the millennium. We're going to be pursuing the knowledge of the Lord. He is going forth and he is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. So where are we at in the Bible? Where are we living at, actually living at? Well, we're living between the second day of Hosea and the third day. Because we're not in the millennial year. We're somewhere at the end of Revelation 2, 3, 21 and 22 and Revelation 4, 1. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. This is the last two chapters in the Laodicea church age, and we're living at that. We're in that church age. And we're at the last verse or two. We're that close to his return. The next thing we're going to hear is Revelation 4.1. After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying come up hither and I will show you things which must take place after this. That's the same thing we hear in 1 Thessalonians 14, which talks about the rapture and the Lord coming back and being in the clouds and a trumpet sound and a voice of an angel speaks and those who are dead in Christ goes up to meet the Lord in the air and we, which are the true believers, will go up afterwards Amen. to meet him in the air. Amen. That's the rat. That's his first coming. Yes. We talk about Christ's return. That's his first return. The rapture. He doesn't touch the, his feet on the Mount of Olives. He's in the air. He's calling the church home. It's the only ones that are being called home at this time. His true church. And I'm emphasizing his true church. So where else are we at? in the Bible. Maybe we're at 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. <coughs> Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now you look at verse 10, and you're thinking, the rapture, and then the earth is going to burn up. That's the way it looks. And that has caused a lot of people to think that the rapture is going to take place after the tribulation. That's not what it's saying. No. We're talking about what? We're talking about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a thousand years. Because Peter in verse 8 tells us that a day of the Lord is a thousand years. Mm -hmm. So what takes place on the day of the Lord? The first thing comes is as a thief in the night. That's the rapture. All thief in the night is a rapture. It's something that is not being expected, but it happens all of a sudden. That's the rapture of the church. Nobody's looking for it. The only one's looking for the rapture is the true men and women of God. There's even people in the church that aren't looking for the rapture. There might be Christians that aren't looking for the rapture. But the rapture is the first of the day. It's the start of the day. And then you have your seven-year tribulation. 
and then you have your millennial reign, and then you have the white throne judgment, and then the Lord burns up the earth. Amen. He sent a flood the first time. He said, I'm not going to do it that, that anymore. I'm sending fire to cleanse this earth. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of the thousand years, the seventh thousand years. Finally, in verse 11, Peter says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person are you to be? What manner of person, man or woman, are we to be right now? If on the doorstep Christ is ready to return, what kind of person ought we to be? Peter says, you ought to be in holy conduct and godliness. Are you holy? How are we made holy? Are you guys holy? Do you feel holy? I don't. But I know I'm holy. I know I'm holy. Because I'm following Christ with all my heart. And Christ makes me holy. I can't be holy. The best I can do would mean be close to holy. But if we are serious about our walk with Christ and we are trying to hear Christ, then He's going to make us holy. The men's breakfast yesterday came with a, a man that I known since 1976. He's one of my best friends. I got a few good friends, and he's one of them. And he told us in the last four years since he retired, he's been doing these hikes thousands and thousands of miles, and he's won 50 young people to the Lord through these hikes. And he told how he was called by God to start these hikes. He was listening to God. I'll tell you, none of us can do what he's done. But he's committed to pleasing God. I know a lot more about him, and there's things about him that <clears throat> we couldn't even do, because he's done other things. A lot in the past. But that's somebody that God knows that he can call on to do what he asks him to do. And that's what we need to do as Christians today. Because God's calling every one of us to do something for him. And that's what we ought to be. Will there be Christians who have to go through the tribulation? My son uh, used the parable of the talents in uh, Matthew 25, 14, and 30 in his sermon a few weeks ago. It's in chapter 25 of Matthew, as I said. And it talks about the kingdom of God and the master going away and leaving his kingdom in the hands of his servants. And he gives one servant five talents to invest, to, to make him money. And he gives another servant two talents. And he gives the third one one. He said to, he gives them this to what they're able to do, their ability to do something with his talents while he's gone. Well, one was given five talents, doubled it to ten. The one that was given two talents, doubled it. To four. But the one who was given one talent took it and buried it in the ground. And it says in verse 24, and then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. And there you have what is yours. How 
may us hide our past. What are you talking about, Joe? How may you have God placed somebody in your sight, in your life, and said to you, tell them about me. Tell them about Jesus. How many of you, because of your flesh, being embarrassed, instead of saying to them, I'd like to tell you about Jesus, how many of you said, you know something? You need God. Or you need to go to church. That's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to say to him, you know something? Give me 20 seconds of your time. I want to tell you that we have a God that loves you. Amen. And he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins. And if you will ask him to forgive your sins and come into your heart, you can be saved. That's what he wants us to be. That's not hiding our talents. That's putting our talents in the bank as, as the master has told this one to hit his talent. You should have put it in the bank and made some interest. That's what God wants us to do. He calls this uh, person that hid the talent, he says, and he will cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, and there he will be weeping and gnashing of his teeth. Mm -hmm. This parable represents the church. It represents the Billy Graham that can go out and win millions. That's who the 5,000 talent people represent. It represents the two town people, like Pastor Dirk or Keith, that wins a multitude of people. But that represents the people that should be doing something and isn't doing something. What will happen to them? And like I said, in verse uh, 25, 1 through 13, I didn't notice this till last night when I was looking this over. And it's a parable of the foolish virgins. The ten virgins, there was five wise and five foolish. And uh, Matt, the kingdom, in the kingdom of representing the kingdom of God, the church, and the bridegroom went away to prepare the wedding feast, which Christ has done. He's gone away to prepare the wedding feast for the church. And he's coming back, it says in verse, in uh, chapter 25 of the parable. He's coming back. And there was two types. Like I said, there was wise virgins who kept themselves in the knowledge of God, working for God, doing the things of God. And then there was the foolish who fell asleep, who was lacking, who, didn't do, who wasn't doing anything for God. And when he came back, they asked the ten wise virgins, give us some of your oil so our lamps won't go out. And the wise virgin said, no, you go get your own oil. I just have enough to get the, to meet the groom. And Jesus comes back, and he calls for the church to come with him. And five wise virgins went to heaven to be in the wedding feast five foolish virgins stayed behind. And it says in verse 2, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, As shortly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man comes. That's why I believe that the rapture, to me, all the study I've done, I believe it's going to be at the beginning.
because it has to be a time when nobody expects it. If it happens in the middle, people are counting the time when the Antichrist comes on the scene, and they can count to the middle of the tribulation period and say, ah, Christ is about ready to come. Or if he comes at the end of the tribulation, they can know that if they're in the tribulation, that at the end, Christ is going to come. But that's not what it says. It says he comes when you're not thinking or watching for him. Each of these speak of Jesus going away for a while and coming back for the church. In each church, there was wise and foolish, those working to bring salvation to others, and those who were like the Pharisee, who worked hard playing the church, but not doing the will of God. I always wonder about the foolish virgin and the unprofitable servants, and what would happen to them at the rapture. I was listening to Perry Stone, he's another one that I trust. He has short teaching on Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 48. It's the story of the faithful service and the bad service. In verse 35 of Luke 12, 35, he says, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. In other words, he's talking about the faithful servant working and doing the will of the Lord and letting his light shine, verse 35. And you yourself be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks, they open to him immediately. Verse 36, they are waiting for his return. In verse 37, blessed are those servants who the master, when he comes, will find watching. And surely I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Verse 38 tells us we don't know when he will return. We have to watch. We have to be ready, just like the good virgins. Verse 39, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allow his house to be broken in. The same analogy that Peter used in 2 Peter 3.10 of the thief, he will be caught up unexpectedly. And finally in verse 40, we're told a faithful servant is always ready for the Son to come. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at the hour you do not expect. That's the good servant. We're working, the light's shining, we're waiting, we're watching. That's the good servant. Are you a good servant? Am I a good servant? But the bad servant won't be ready. Luke 12, 45. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delayed, is coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk. That's people not expecting Christ to return. And they're backslidden to their own wor little worldly self. There's a lot of people in the church that aren't living close to God anymore. They're living the world of God. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at the hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. The rapture takes place and that servant's left behind. 
Is there a Christian going to be left in the church behind? Yeah. If you're not living for God, if you're not giving your all to God, if you're not the true church, you're going to be left behind. We need to examine ourselves. What servant are we? And that servant who knew his master's will, he knew his will, a bad servant, and did not prepare himself or to do according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Seven years tribulation, that's a lot of beating and stripes. So which servant are you this morning? Examine yourself. Be honest with yourself. Are you a wise virgin or a foolish virgin? Are you a good servant gaining souls for Christ or are you serving a servant playing church? Are you a faithful servant or a bad servant? Are you watching? Are you waiting? Enjoying or are you sleeping unprepared, fearful, lazy, unbelieving that he is not coming back? Mm -hmm. Are you backslidden? I don't know any, how any of you are watching. All I know is one thing. I know he's coming back. In the prayer I asked when we was fasting, my main prayer was that God would open doors for me to witness. And that I would have the boldness to witness. That I wouldn't say, you need, you need to go to church. I might as well not even witness if I'm going to say that. Mm -hmm. You have to get to a point in your life where you can say the name of Jesus. And it doesn't bother you one bit. I know where you, some of you might be. When I first became a Christian, even when I first started preaching, the flesh didn't want me to use the name of Jesus. Every time there was a door open to witness, I had to fight. And sometimes I didn't use the name of Jesus. Sometimes I did fail. And sometimes I said, oh, you need God. Or you need to come to my church didn't do a thing. We have to get to a point, and we're in the end time, when souls, we need to pluck souls out of Satan's hand and get them saved. And we need to be bold. If you're not bold, you need to come up here at the end of the, and pray with these people for boldness. If you can't say to, even say to your wife, Jesus is Lord, is my Lord, then you've got a problem. If you can't say to your kids, you need Jesus in your life, you got a problem. You, don't, you need boldness. What would be the first thing that you would do if you knew Christ was coming tomorrow? I would go to a person that I know is not saved but most dear to me, and I would be trying to be unsaved. And that's what we need to be like every day. We need to be telling our kids that they're not saved. You need Jesus. We, we don't need to be, beat around the bush for them. We need to go at, and go at, at them hard. I thank God that my son and my daughter and their family are all saved. And it wasn't always that way. But I always trusted in God and made sure that they went to church and I told him Jesus. And I made sure that they heard Jesus. And we need to be that way now. Not just with our children and our family, but with our friends, with the waitress in the Applebee's, with the cashier. You know, all you have to do is say, I did to a waitress in Applebee's. She brought the check and uh, brought my and brought the, my receipt back and I had a tip and I had a track that I always give out. And I said to that waitress, I said, can I have 20 seconds of your time? Just 20 seconds. 
He said, oh, yeah. I said, you know something? Jesus, God loves you. And he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And if you ask him into your heart and pray and believe, he'll save you. She got up from kneeling down by the table. She said, I almost could cry. She had tears in her eyes. I gave her a track. I said, there's a prayer on the front of this track. If you pray that prayer sincere, you'll be saved. There's always a way God can show to witness to people. And it only takes one step.